Welcome to the Student Success Podcast. I'm Al Solano, founder of the Continuous Learning Institute, or CLI, a higher education online resource focused on providing community college and open access university educators with practical information on how to get results at their campus. As a resource within CLI, the Student Success Podcast is focused on just that, the challenges, opportunities, failures, and successes of practices intended to improve student success and equity. The goal is to leave you with thought-provoking ideas, not some bolts information, and or lessons learned from the field so you can consider how you might apply them to your institutional context. For today's podcast, it's a pleasure to have Dr. Darla Cooper, who currently serves as the Executive Director for the Research and Planning Group for the California Community Colleges, also known as the RP Group. She has worked in the community college system for over 20 years, having previously held institutional research director positions at a variety of colleges. She led Student Support Redefined, a landmark research project that examined what supports student success and co-directed Through the Gate, a research study that examined what happens with students who appear to, to transfer but do not. Dr. Cooper has extensive experience serving as an external evaluator for several federal and private foundation grants and has worked on various other projects designed to promote student success, including the Aspen Prize for Community College Excellence and the American Association of Community Colleges Pathways Project. It's a pleasure to have you on the Student Success Podcast, Darla. Well, thank you for having me, Al. It's great to be here. Appreciate it. One of the things that I really love about the RP Group is the fact that I've had the opportunity to do so many projects with the RP Group. We did a project on integrated planning. I've been involved in projects to do student focus groups, to do customized training. So I have a big heart for the RP group, lots of smart, brilliant, hardworking people. So it's a pleasure to have you as part of the podcast. One of the things that I I like to start with guests is if you can please tell us something about yourself that beyond your your experience, some kind of hobby or superpower you might have. So what, what can you share with us, uh, Darla? Well, I'll start with a, a hobby that unfortunately I'm not able to, to do now, but I'm so looking forward to doing very, very soon, which is travel plus photography. I love both separately, but I love them even more when they're together. I love traveling the world. I've been to six of the seven continents, taking pictures all over the world. And I, my home is my gallery. If you ever visited me, you would see pictures, my picture, <laughs> in every room. I do photo books for almost every trip um, to, to tell that trip's uh, story and help me remember um, <laughs> where I was, what I was doing, who I was with, all of that. But um, I, I just, I love it. I've missed it so much this last year and I've already got a, a, a very long list of places that I'm, I'm, I'm ready to go as soon as I am able. And I, I like to think I have lots of superpowers, but the one I will share with you is I see mistakes in writing. You know, I, I see the, the punctuation, the grammar. People call me the grammar police. It's fine. I'll take it. But I see it, you know, on, in a billboard. I see it in a magazine. I see it you know, in a presentation, I, I see them everywhere. And so in some cases, it's a gift and sometimes it's a curse. But it is a superpower, I guess, depending. <laughs> so in terms of your travel, do you, do you have a, a favorite place or two? Italy. I love Italy. Not exactly sure why. Uh, maybe the food. Might be the food. Might be the gelato, all the pasta. Um, I love that it has, uh, I, I love history and, and I find Italy to be very interesting and, and other parts of Europe because it's the juxtaposition of ancient history, ro- you know, Roman history next to the Renaissance and literally in the same place sometimes. And I just, that, that's just fascinating to me. So, and you know, they have art. The weather's kind of like ours here in California, so that doesn't that doesn't hurt. That's what came, that's what always comes to mind. And when you take pictures, is do you like? Uh, is it more people? Is it inanimate objects? A combination of all? Uh, what do you have? Particular subject that you like to take pictures of? I call them wonders, uh, whether they are natural wonders or man-made wonders. I love uh, architecture, beautiful buildings, 
But I also love, you know, the mountains. I love going to national parks. I did a whole trip through like all the parks in Utah and and I've been to a, a lot of the parks here in the West and just beautiful, natural wonders. And so um, that's how I would probably describe most of what I take a picture of is some kind of either architectural or natural wonder. So I think there's some alignment between you, you go to these different countries and, and you you take snapshots of a, of a story. And I think the RP group, that's one of the many things that it does so well is that it, it captures stories, specifically of students. Because the RP group is, I, I believe it's unique in California. There aren't, I don't know of any other state that has this research, nonprofit research and planning arm for their system. Could you um, unpack what, what is the RP group exactly? What do you do? What are some of the projects, services? How do you support the field? So we have our, our history as a membership organization for the institutional research, planning, and effectiveness professionals that work at the California Community Colleges. Um, we, we call them IRPE, again, Institutional Research Planning and Effectiveness. And so that is our, our, our membership. That is who we primarily serve. Um, but we are of the California Community Colleges system. And so we also serve the whole system, um, primarily, you know, the students. And while most of us don't work, interact directly with students on a day to day basis, they have to be the center and the reason for everything that we do, regardless of how many, uh, let's say, degrees away from a student we, we might personally be. And so we work to support those professionals in in their work to support their colleges. To, to do research, to do planning, to, to, to do assessments, to, to, make, uh, to make decisions, to, to look at effectiveness, all for the success of our students. And so that's, that's where we got our, our start. Um, and that's what our, our strategy is, really, is to support the researchers on, on these campuses, these IRPE professionals, by doing research ourselves by um, a lot of professional development, again, both that uh, target the, the IRPE community, but also the broader community college community. We partner with different organizations to reach faculty, to reach administrators, to reach classified professionals. And we work with like Student Senate, for example, to try to reach students because we need to involve students much more than we do in, in our research of them. <laughs> um, and it's, it's something that, that we're cognizant of, and I'm not saying that we're there yet, but we are hopefully moving in that direction. And speaking of moving in that direction, actually, I think you, you, you are there in, in many respects. I think with the landmark study of student support redefined and the six factors, could you please explain that study? What are the six factors, A and B? Could you please provide examples of how colleges have used all six, if you want, or, or some of them? It's just some real life examples of, of how uh, colleges use Student Support Redefined. So Student Support Redefined is a, a study that we did where we went to the students and asked them, what helps you be successful? And we learned so much. There's, it's hard to summarize sometimes succinctly, but we did identify uh, what we call the six success factors. And most of what students told us in answer to that question of what helps you be successful uh, fell into those, uh, one of those six factors or multiple factors. If you, if you look at the graphic for the factors, you'll see that they all touch each other. Right. They're, they're all connected with each other because uh, in most cases, you, you don't work with a student one factor at a time. That's that's not the point. So let me tell you the factors first and then I'll get into what they look like in action. So I'm going to tell them to you in the order in which students prioritized them in, in terms of their success. So the first one was directed. Directed means that the student has a goal and knows how to achieve it. It is not simply enough to, to have a goal. You have to know what you're doing, what you need to do in order to reach that goal. The second factor is focused. 
So that's kind of the uh, keeping your eye on the prize, doing the work every day, staying motivated, time management, study skills. It's all the things that you need in order to stay focused um, on, on making progress towards your goal. And when we talked to students, they talked about those two factors as being kind of inextricably linked. Um, they, they said things like, well, you can't be successful without both. You, you know, the, you have to have direction. You have to have focus. They're, they go together. So focus came in a very close second <laughs> to uh, direct it. What was interesting was that the third factor, again, in terms of importance, was nurtured. And this was the factor where we got a little bit of pushback originally when we proposed it in that we had people saying, that's not my job. You know, I'm, I'm not here to baby students or mother them, you know. And, and when we talked to students, it really came down to, does anybody care? <laughs> does anybody know my name? Does anybody know why I'm here? Do they notice if I'm not here? Do they care if I succeed? Do they care if I fail? Does anybody care? And so that was that, that took some people by surprise that that would come in right after having direction and focus is that people need other people <laughs> to care about them. The, the fourth factor was engaged, which is that students are active participants in their learning, not passive vessels that we pour information into. And, and that students need to be engaged in and out of class. And there's, a, there's an onus on us to, first of all, explain to students why. Why should they be engaged? What's in it for them? You know, what are they going to get out of it? I think sometimes we just assume that students know, well, it's good for you. Or because I, t because I said so, right? Because I, I know what's best for you. We need to do a better job of, of, of engaging students by telling them why being engaged is, is important to their success. Similarly, uh, with the next factor, connected, connected is that sense of belonging, right? That sense of, of that you're a part of something larger than yourself. Well, this was another one where, you know, we had students in the study say, why? Why should I be connected? What, what's in it for me? What difference does it make? This is another place where we could do a better job of, of telling students why being connected you know, is important. And there's all kinds of research that many people I'm sure are familiar with that shows the the connection uh, between feeling connected, feeling that sense of belonging and student success. The last factor is valued. And what I found interesting about that one is I, I think all of us have an inherent sense of what it feels like to be valued, right? It's, it's you have something to offer, you're able to offer that. And when you do, it's appreciated in, in some way. Even though it came in technically, I guess, last when students prioritized it, when you talk to students about when, when I talked to students about feeling valued, um, you could see it in, in, in what a different, you could hear it in what a difference it made to their success. And I, I often challenge, you know, my colleagues to think about it from their own perspective. When, as an employee, perhaps at a college, when you feel valued by the college, aren't you just a, even a little bit more likely to put up with something, <laughs> to stick it out? to go the extra mile, why, do, why would students be any different? If they feel valued, if they feel like they matter to the college, maybe they'll try a little bit harder. Maybe they'll put up with some, some things, and push through some of their, their challenges, seek out help because they feel like they matter. So I, I really try to emphasize that don't, don't read too much into the fact that it came you know, in six out of six. They're all important. Maybe not in the same way, at the same time, the same intensity to every student, but we need to make sure that we are, are taking those factors into account. In terms of things that I've seen uh, over the years, colleges implementing, I've just been so impressed with the, the creativity, how they've used them. There was one college where they had, they, they had a competition uh, where students wrote about a factor and the, the students who won got placed on, you know, those lamp, you know, the, the light lamp post banners all over campus. So, you know, they, they won, like I said, they wrote this essay and, and were placed on a banner that said directed. And then you could go to their website and read the, you know, what the students said about what directed, you know, meant to their su success. 
um, another school created a brochure based on the six factors for students to help to, to, to put that information in their hands. Like these are things that you can do and seek out to help you be successful. There's, there are colleges that have used it to help frame things like their onboarding process, like looking at what, what are we doing to help students really be successful and setting them up for success? And how does being directed and staying focused and feeling nurtured, how does all of that you know, factor into it? The other thing that, that we did in response to a request from a college was create a 10 ways document. I was going around doing different presentations on the Students Port Redefined, and one of the colleges asked me, well, can you just tell, give me like a top 10 list of what faculty can do to support student success? And I was like, yes, yes, I can. <laughs> and we went back to the data. We went back to what students told us and, and came up with these 10 ways that came from the students. They're, they're not our 10 ways. You know, they're not from the RP group. These are things that students said helped them. And so they're, they're also not hypothetical. These are real people <laughs> with real teachers that made a difference in terms of helping students um, experience those factors. There's also another, so there's two 10 ways, just to clarify. There's one for faculty and one for anyone working at the campus. And that's one of our, our main themes from the, the study is everyone at the college can and should play a role in student success. And so that the other 10 ways guide to, tries to point out, no matter what your job is, you can support student success. And it may be in a way that's not in your job description. Thank you for that. Well, one of the things I appreciate about you, Darla, is that you're, you're the leader of this organization. You got a lot on your plate, you're providing guidance for it, but you're not afraid to roll up your sleeves. You're actually still doing focus groups. Your, yes, your superpower, by the way, is very well known, and and it makes everybody that much better because everybody uh, looks at their emails more closely, looks at any document before they send it to you, Darla. So your, your superpower has an impact in a good way. So because you've done so many focus groups, I've done so many too, but I'm sure you've done way more than me. Can you think about some of the top Things that you hear educators say that I'll, I'll be candid, that just kind of make you cringe because they make such big assumptions about students. But because you actually talk with hundreds, if not thousands of students and seen all this data, do you have any of your quote unquote favorites? Well, I think you, you mentioned the word assumptions. And, and that's kind of my biggest takeaway is uh, and, and you talk about cringing. It, it's those assumptions that uh, that we all. I'll put myself in there. We've all made, continue to make about why students do what they do or don't do what they what they don't do. I've talked to enough students to know that we're not always right. <laughs> Actually, we're often wrong. <laughs> we assume things about students' motivation. I, I see a lot of assumptions that you know this student just doesn't care. This student is not prioritizing you know education or my class. You know, the student is disrespecting, you know, me, you know, or my subject. And my question back to them is, OK, you, you, why do you think that? First of all, what where is this coming from? You know, to try to un, unpack that. And then I always ask, well, well have you talked to the student? <laughs> have you asked the student what's going on? And, and, and again, you're not going to go to them and say, why do you always come to class late? Right. That that's not helpful. But to to show going back to that nurtured factor, right, going back and with some care, asking the student, you know, something more along the lines of I've noticed that you've missed class or I noticed that you leave early, you, you come late or you you haven't turned in this assignment. Is there is there anything I can help with? Right. And, and as opposed to, you know, assuming that you know, the student, again, just doesn't, doesn't care, doesn't want to do better, doesn't want to do the assignment. And I'm not saying that that's never true. <laughs> of course it is. We all have things and think back to when we were in school. <laughs> but we need to talk to our students. And more importantly, we need to listen. We need to listen. And that's what doing these focus groups have, has really done for me as a, as a practitioner 
is giving me a, a space, an opportunity to, to listen to students. And we always include student quotes in, in any of our reports. Um, I, I personally like to debrief with the, the college where I'm doing the focus group to, to kind of give them my impressions before the report comes out, tell them what I'm seeing, you know, things that may not make it into the report, right? But trying to tell just the student's story, uh, trying to, to be that, I take, I take this responsibility seriously as, as an advocate for students because they're not always listened to. They're not even, they're not even asked <laughs> in the first place. So many times it's done my heart really some good when I, I tell students in the focus group what I'm doing. You know, I tell them that this is my purpose, that I want to hear from them. I want them to be honest with me. I want them to trust me with their stories and that I promise them I'm going to take your story forward. I may not be able to fix any of the things that you're telling me, but I will definitely carry the water and, and, and make sure, you know, that somebody hears what, what you're telling me. And, and that's, that's like the biggest thing for me to, in what, and one reason why I want to continue doing them is I never want to lose that touch of, of hearing directly from students. And I'm, I'm so glad that I, I didn't necessarily, I'm not going to take a bunch of credit and say like, well, this was something I said I was going to do when I got this job. <laughs> it just, I, I was kind of in the middle of doing things when I got this job. So I had to finish, you know, what I started, but in doing that, I said, you know, I, I've got to figure out a way to, to, to keep doing this, to keep that, you know, uh, on the ground, firsthand experience from students. I have to say one of, one of my favorites is, this is especially when Guided Pathways was being rolled out, is that students, they have to explore and wonder. They just, you really, they really need to wonder. And Focus group after focus group after focus group, students tell us, especially our students of color, I got a ton of pressure to to get a job. And I had to convince my family that I that to go to college. I need the college to help me with a goal and to get through this as quickly as possible. That's that's gotta be one of my favorites because it's it's an equity issue. And that's the other what I wanted to segue into is that RP Group has for a long time actually been focused on equity. We we know that institutions, organizations, the whole world woke up after George Floyd, but there was already some things already in process at the RP Group. Can you explain a little bit more about the, the, the equity work? Absolutely. So I'll go back and say equity has been in our work for many years. Going back to Student Support Redefined, if you look at our original research question, we called out African-American and Hispanic Latinx students and said, we want to, to find out if when we ask students what makes them successful, do those two student groups say anything different? Do they say that, that, that they, they, they need different support to, to, to help them? And uh, the answer was yes. So, for example, we found that with both of those groups, they were more likely to say that failing a class would might make them more likely to not return. And so this is something we can do something about. We, we need to help our students learn, understand the difference between being a failure and failing. They're not the same. Right. We all fail. We've all failed at something. And, and we need to, to help our students. You know, if you're comfortable, share your failures because they look at us and they, they it's like we came out of the womb this way. You know, that that we you know, none of us had struggles. None of us had to overcome. Uh, none of us fail. And so we we need to to uh, share with our students and help them understand and and keep going. And, and understand that that failing is a part of it. Another example was the nurturing. Our African-American students were more likely than other groups to say that having someone at the college care about them was important to their success. 
So, so there, there's that. Our, our, our latest uh, study, Through the Gate, we, we disaggregated that data from the start. That was always the intention to see, are there differences? Are students from different groups experiencing transfer in a different way? We started with the, just to back up again, through the gate is, is our transfer study that, that hones in on students who seemingly have completed all or most of their transfer requirements, but they haven't transferred. And so, the, you know, the natural question is, what's, what's going on? What, what's missing? What's, what's, what kind of barriers are, are in place? What, 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 is, what is happening? And so, again, from the very start, you know, built in, we wanted to look at those kinds of differences, and and we we found differences there um, as well. For example, with African American students, they brought up, they were more likely to bring up transportation as a concern um, related to transfer. Like, will I be able to get to the university? Something. I mean, some of the sometimes these things are 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 not that difficult, you know, to address. Another thing that we found with, I think, both African-American and our Latinx students, they were they were more likely to say that they were that they had used transfer resources and that they found them helpful. So that tells us that we need to to do a better job of making sure that these resources are getting to these populations. Another example was a lot of them are first generation students. They, They were more likely to say that they didn't have anyone in their circle whether that's family, friends, neighborhood who had gone to college. We need to bring, you know, let's bring some successful transfer students back, put them in front of the current students to say, to show them this is, this is possible. You can do this. Let, let me help you. Let me show you the way. So I said, those are some of the findings, you know, there's lots more that we found with, with Through the Gate. Um, but even with uh, all of that, I'll, I'll go back to fall of 19. We can remember back the time before COVID. Our, the RP group had been doing quite a bit of internal work, um, trying to get you know our own house in order, uh, clarify things, document things, uh, et cetera. And we were getting toward towards the end of that work. And I, you know, equity was starting to, you know, that word was starting to be used more. We were it was starting to be much more of a focus at that time. And I started to to think about well you know, maybe we should focus on this next year, meaning uh, the year uh, starting with like fall of, of uh, 2020, going through academic year, fall 2020, spring 2021. We need to think about, okay, so we've, we've included this in our work in the past and, and in the present, but what is our commitment to equity as an organization? Uh, how does it show up in all of our work, not just our research, but but everything that we do? Planted some seeds at that time through and starting even in going into spring of 20. Okay, all right, let's let's kind of plan for this. Let's start looking at this. And then obviously the pandemic <laughs> hit and, and so, you know, attention was drawn in a, to other places <laughs> uh, because of that. But then after that, uh, George Floyd was murdered and, and the country changed. And it definitely created a, a greater sense of urgency and priority for us, the RP group, to be looking and answering these questions about equity within our organization and what what does that look like. It also became really um, obvious, at least to me, during that time that we weren't going to be able to do this on our own because we didn't have the necessary expertise and that we were going to need help trying to understand equity and social justice and anti-racism on more than just perhaps an intuitive level. (laughs) And we needed to be able to put ourselves in a position where we could help, again, going back to our our mission and our strategies to help the IRPE professionals in the colleges, uh, because they are, you know, they, in providing data and in providing disaggregated data, you, you have to be called upon to to sometimes have and lead difficult conversations, most courageous conversations. And we are trying to work towards uh, being able to provide that kind of support um, to that. So what we've done so far in this regard is uh, we've created a a task force that is um, 
morphing into a, commi- a committee, a standing committee for the organization that's made up of uh, board members, staff members, and IRPE community members. We're just beginning our journey. And we've, we've, we've learned a lot, even in just the short amount of time, that this is, this is a long road. This is not a checkbox thing. You can't just check the box and go, well, equity, done. You know, this is something that we're, we're going to grow into as an organization. That's been challenging in a way as well, because there's a lot of pressure, either imagined or real, that every time something happens, you have to come out with a statement, you know, con- condemning whatever hor- horrific thing just happened. And, you know, I, I pushed back against that in, in that I, I didn't want us, uh, in working with my board president, we didn't want to just put a statement out because of, I don't know, peer pressure, uh, because everybody else was doing it. It's like, if we can't say something about what we're going to do about it as an organization, then what are we really saying? We're saying we're against horrific things. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's great. But, it, but every time I know I read one of those statements, I, I said, but what are you going to do about it? You know, either internally or externally or something. And that's what I found was missing from a lot of those those statements. Um, that that's has been a challenge and and continues uh, to be one to to try to communicate that we're working on this, but that it's it's not going to happen overnight because we want to do this in a meaningful way. You know, we're we're trying to change our organization um, into one that is consistently and clearly equitable, and focuses on that. So as you know, Darla, the, the, the RP group listserv, the, the members, people who sign up for it are not just California, people all over the United States, if not the world. I remember uh, reading your email and, and it took a few days, as you said, uh, people were you know frantic getting out statements, but yours was so thoughtful and you even explained why you had to be thoughtful. And so it was a really powerful statement. One of the things that I wanted to unpack a little bit in terms of equity are are disabled students. To be honest, I'm not particularly fond of that word, disabled. I just they're just able differently. That not this, uh, you know. So my the thing about this these group of students is that they may be defined. We they may have had, for example, in their K twelve experience, have been really been able to have parents who were able to push through the system and get them, for example, an IEP, right? An IEP is an individual education plan, which in the K-12 world, that puts them into that category of special education. But it's a lot of people don't know this, that it's actually really difficult to get one because the district kind of, depending on the district, they fight families because it's expensive. What happens is that community colleges get so many students who are in this category of special education disabled, but they also get the students who would never help, never had that designation. And who knows what percentage of those students we have. Given that you've done focus groups with these group of students, can you please share any assumptions that educators might might have about them? Again, going back to how doing these different focus groups was such an opportunity for me to learn and to gain insight into the experiences that, that I didn't have, haven't had, to show uh, care and concern. So most of what I heard from, from these students was, was positive um, in terms of the support that they receive from their um, uh, DSPS, or Disabled Students Programs and Services, um, offices on their campuses. And, and they talk about, you know, faculty being supportive uh, with making the accommodations that they need to support their learning. And so I want, I want to say that first, because I think the, the majority of, of uh, faculty and, and classified professionals and administrators are, are, are doing or trying to do right by these students. But unfortunately, I did hear about some experiences, again, that these students shared that even if it's just happening to one student, that's one student too many. 
And so this is one of those cases where it's, it's not about representation. It's not about well, how many students is that? It was that one. <laughs> that student experienced it. And that's, that's wrong. I, I heard from students, you know, about faculty who, who didn't understand accommodations and, and resisted them. You know, things like, well, you can't record me. And it's like, but that's my accommodation. I need to record the lecture. Well, I, I refuse to be recorded. And then, you know, putting the student in a position of having to go back to the, you know, the office to, to do, you know, it's just like, huh. <sighs> I also, you know, on the real far end of the spectrum, you know, had students tell, share with me that uh, just the, the incredible insensitivity, forget that some of what the, they were doing was against the law. <laughs> you know, there is a law <laughs> um, that requires these things. But asking a, a students at the, on the first day of class, well, who has an accommodation? Raise your hand. And you're just like, whoa, that's not appropriate. I had an, another student I remember telling me that a faculty member, she gave the faculty her accommodation paperwork and he looked at it and he said, well, you look all right to me. What's wrong with you? And you just, you know, as a, as the person kind of hearing this, you know, my instinct, uh, I didn't do it, but my instinct is always, I just want to hug them. You know, I just want to, I, I, I want to apologize. And I often do apologize, you know, on behalf of that person, you know, whatever it is, you know, obviously I don't know who, who it was, but just to let that student know, you're not wrong. That wasn't the right thing to do. And I, somebody needed to tell you that. I don't know if anybody had up to this point, but you needed to know. I feel like you need to know someone in some kind of authority position, if I say so myself, to just to tell them that wasn't right. And you shouldn't have gone through that. And I'm sorry. I'm sorry that, that you went through that. And I had students make suggestions about, can we make sure that faculty understand what the law is and and how to be more sensitive and maybe just humane, (laughs) you know, with not trying to, you know, embarrass people in front of it. And then the other thing that, that, and this is, you know, I'm kind of embarrassed to admit, but it hadn't occurred to me because we in these focus groups, we heard from, you know, African-American students and Native American students about how they didn't see themselves represented on campus, right? They, they, they didn't have a teacher who looked like them. They didn't see you know, other, there weren't a lot of other students who looked like them, things like that. And so we've heard a lot about that. I, until a, a group of disabled, differently able students said this to me, I hadn't thought about it that they, they don't have role models on our campuses either. They don't see faculty who, quote unquote, look like them, right? Or, or who have gone through or are ex- currently experiencing what, what they are. And uh, in one particular case, I remember it was a, a blind student who was, was sharing, it's like, I, I, I need role models. I need to know that what's possible for me. They need to, to have role models that they, um, can uh, admire and follow and and do all that. And, and again, it was one of those things where if that's not been your experience, you don't often think of it. But that's why we need to listen. We need to open up and, and talk to all different kinds of students with all different kinds of, of, of situations and backgrounds and experiences and cultures and all of these things to, to broaden our understanding and, and to see things um, from other other people's other students' um, perspectives, yeah. Like I said, the, these focus groups they just they they've just done so much for me as a as a person, and and as a professional. Just um, I've learned so much from students, so much. Wow, that's that's powerful, Darla. You, you know, it's interesting that what I find sometimes I give uh, so many people grace. I I I think you know I, I write a lot about how important. Uh, kindness is right, and sometimes we're in meetings and people are are behaving in a particular way, or they they misinterpret something, misunderstand something, and we can get impatient. And we don't know how many of these students that these people w- went to college, right? They survived it. They've never had an IEP, but they've had some kind of way that they just learn different, take in information and process it differently. And sometimes it takes uh, patience for us when we're working with our own peers 
that we may need to scaffold information a bit better, sequence it a bit better. I encourage everyone, when you go to meetings, please provide visuals. We're highly visual creatures. When we verbalize things, many people have their own mental models about it. And But if we're all seeing the same thing, and obviously if there are people who uh, cannot see, you, you need to do an even better job scaffolding and sequencing what, what you're saying, because we don't know what people are dealing with. They've survived it. They've survived college. They got a job. It takes that extra bit of kindness. I did have one other thing, uh, again, talking to the differently abled students. Uh, sometimes I've, I've been able to witness wonderful interactions between the students in these focus groups from, you know, some student talking about a particular teacher and another student saying, hey, wait, what teacher is that? What's that name? Can I get your phone number afterwards? I've seen this, this wonderful thing where they're helping each other. And if we can, I've heard, that's another thing I've heard from so many students is like, you know, well, I'm shy and I don't, I don't make friends easily. If the college could put me in, into situations where I can meet students, maybe have similar goals, you know, things, things like that. Well, one of the one of the things I witnessed, again, going back to the uh, differently able students was this group where there were the students who were, I guess you would say physically disabled and visibly disabled, right? They were in a wheelchair. They uh, were blind, something that we, we could e- more easily see um, that this person was disabled. And then you had the other group with invisible disabilities, like learning disabilities or traumatic brain injury, right? Or psychological disabilities. And this interesting conversation started happening between those two groups, the visible and the invisible. And I got out of the way. That's the other thing sometimes in these focus groups, I have to know when to get out of the way and let and give them some space, give them some time, even if they're not answering my question. But I try to make sure that it that the focus group is not just about me and the data I need for my study. But if I can impart information that's helpful or I can allow students to to connect and and give each other information that's helpful, I want to do that. But again, the the students with the they talked about the advantages and disadvantages of having your disability be visible or invisible. Um, And so, for example, the students with visible disabilities didn't have to prove they were disabled. Right. But the invisible disability students felt like they had to prove it. Right. And then the visible disability students thought, you know, they talked about how they can't hide. (laughs) It's out there. They can't, you know, it's everyone knows. Whereas the, you know, they, they looked at the invisible, the students with invisible disabilities and said, no one knows just by looking at you that you have this disability. But they know by looking at me and you just saw the empathy create between these two groups to where it's like, oh, I hadn't thought of it that way. Oh, I see, you know, the advantages and disadvantages that I have that you have. And so it was just this actually kind of beautiful thing to, to, to witness and, and to, to, to see them supporting each other in that way. And again, I think if we can find ways to bring students together. And, and another thing that came out of this is, is for, for student groups that maybe pe- student faculty or, or classified professionals don't understand, give, give, them, give those students an opportunity to get in front of those groups and share their experience. I mean, that's how I learned, right? It, it wasn't in that setting. But I'm learning through these focus groups, the experiences of different kinds of students. But um, I, I've heard of examples of, of international student panels, for example. A lot of people don't understand what it's like to be an international student, all the rules and regulations and all of these things that they have to go through to, to get here and, and, and how what you do in the classroom affects them as, as, or as a counselor or what, whatever it is. And so they would have students share their experiences, you know, like maybe at some kind of assembly or, or con- convocation to help just to, again, to create a little bit more empathy for our students. That was so powerful. Wow. The story, what you mentioned about the conversations between the invisible and invisibly disabled students. You know, that, and that's what I was talking about earlier was more on that invisible, right? Uh, even for our own colleagues. So thank, thank you for sharing that. What I wanted to move into next is that the RP group does research and planning, but a big part of it, professional development. 
Can you explain more of the kind of PD opportunities that you've done, that you have going on, and what's uh, in store for the future? Absolutely. We have kind of three signature events that happen annually. The first being uh, our what we call our RP conference, um, research and planning, and that is primarily uh, for the researchers and planners, the IRPE professionals at the college to come and and perhaps you know geek out a little bit on on research and planning. Um, but what we've noticed in in recent years is that it that conference is attracting, for lack of a better word, non researchers people where that's not their title, but what that is a sign of is how much research is permeating the entire institution. Everyone needs to be looking at data in their work, you know, different data, but everyone needs to be, you know, looking at and making decisions based on information and based on data, based on research. Um, and so it's, it's, it's wonderful. I think it's wonderful that we, we have all different kinds of people coming to that conference. Another event that we do in the summer is is geared much more much more specifically to those IRP professionals, and that's our summer institute. And it's a um, it sometimes had obviously had to take a different shape this past summer because of, of needing to be in a virtual environment. But it's you know trying to focus on giving researchers a, a, a dedicated time and space and w- where they can focus on improving their craft. On, on learning of, of how to be, become a better researcher. And in the past, we, we've done like two different tracks, one for newcomers. You know, what, what I just got here I, or I've, I haven't been here very long. What do I need to know? Um, and some of it's just very basic information about research in the California community college system because they're, they're researchers, but they were, might have been somewhere else. And there's a lot of nuance and a, a lot of information, you know, about that. And then we've had a veterans track where you know we're, we're past the basics, but it's probably focuses a little bit more on leadership as, as a researcher and how that shows up you know in, in your work. you know a lot of these positions are, are at the ca- president's cabinet level. You're, you're, you, a lot of researchers report directly to the president. What, what is it like to, to operate you know on that level um, and do so successfully? And then the third uh, signature event is our, our larger conference, which is our, our most it's totally inclusive. It's it's probably one of the most inclusive events in the state. Um, and we get people from out of state, but it's, you know, admittedly California uh, focused, but that is our strengthening student success conference. And we get a lot of faculty that come to that. We get a lot of administrators, both uh, instruction and student services. Uh, we get classified professionals, researchers, you know, are there such a wide spectrum. A lot of, of what we have in terms of professional development here in California and in the California community college system is by position. You know, so the, the, the CEOs have, have their professional development, the, the chief instructional officers have theirs, the chief services officers have theirs. So there's all this, you know, kind of thing that happens. And what we try to do with our conference is say everyone is welcome. Everyone can get something out of this, but we this conference is focused on student success, and and we try to to invite pre- presenters who are going to share data. So it's not a research conference, but it's more about well, tell me about your practice, tell me about what you did, but how do you know it worked? So hopefully you have some data. It doesn't always have to be qu- when I say data. Data includes quantitative and qualitative. So the, those are 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 three really big. Um, a three big kind of signature event. We do other professional development. We have something we do now um, called peer to peer, which came out of COVID and trying to create a space um, since we weren't going to be able to get together as a community. We wanted to create a space. And at the beginning of COVID, we were doing it every week. That was a, that was a lot <laughs> to, to pull this together every week. And, and now we, we do it monthly, but it's, it's a very informal space where, where we have a topic and sometimes we have a, a presenter that just kind of gets us started by sharing, you know, their thoughts or some work that they've done. And then we try to have a conversation about and, and encourage everyone to share, you know, if they want about, you know, what are your thoughts? What are your questions? What, what, what have you found works? What, what have you had trouble with? But again, creating that, that space and that's, and again, it's, it's not restricted. 
to IRPE professionals, but a lot of the topics may be more, you know, um, attractive, let's say, to to that group. But I said, it, and it's another place where, you know, I talked um, a little bit about how equity has shown up in our research um, for many years, but it's also been in, in our professional development. And this year in particular, we are, are making sure, you know, for example, our theme for the RP conference this year is, and I, I'm, I'm going to re- read it to you to make sure I get it right, strengthening the role of IRPE in support of diversity, equity, inclusion, and anti-racism. So that, that's, that's a message. We are sending a message with that theme to say this, this is what we're about as an organization, and that's what we're going to focus on this year. Not in a way, I'm hoping people don't think like, oh, we're going to focus on equity this year, and then next year it's back to whatever. Right. Um, We're not supposed to use the word normal at this point, but back to something. And I I don't I don't think so. I think I look at this as the start that we're showing you our commitment to equity in our professional development and that it will be there at the next event and the next event and the next event. (laughs) You know, because I began my career in K-12, I went to so many conferences in that world and then in higher ed. And to be honest, I I just had conference fatigue. And in part, I I just got so tired of kind of self-described thought leaders who would go up and kind of brand their organization. uh, Look at look at us. We got it going on. This is look at us. And one of the few conferences that I, I how I can begin to tell you how much I want to go back to the RP conferences is because you they got to come with data. <laughs> and I think one of the things, the other aspects I, I like about the RP conferences is that there's as much learning going on in the hallways when people leave the sessions as they are in, in the sessions. So that there's a lot of learning there that we can't replicate when we're virtual. So I, I just want to say I can't wait to we're back in person and, and, and go to the RP conferences. I'll mention really quickly because you mentioned the veterans. When I did a focus group with veterans at a veterans center, it was really interesting. They had a board and in the board, it had the title up on the top of the board. It said friendlies. And it had a list of names on the board and the list of names were faculty when I asked them, what, what are, well, I'm, I'm a veteran. I said, I, I know what friendlies are, what, but these, and they're like, well, they're faculty who we consider to be friendly to us because what some of the different abilities, if you will, that they have, some of them are very visible, but for the most part, they're not, you know, post-traumatic stress, all sorts of brain injuries. So even in that community, you can see that they have these discussions, but they made it very <laughs> real for everybody to see that these were our, our friendly. So I, I thought I'd, I'd share that. Um, wow. That's, um, that's, that's impressive <laughs> to, to me um, that they went that far with uh, being transparent within their community. Um, Cause I think that happens within these kind of student communities, but it's not written on a board <laughs> and very, you know, visible, but you remind me that veterans is another group that I was fortunate enough to meet with in these focus groups. And it's another group that I'm not personally uh, familiar with. I, I don't come from uh, you know, a family of veterans. I mean, I obviously know people who have served, but not in, you know, I don't have that kind of intimate knowledge, right? Either, you know, one degree separation or directly. And it's another group that I learned so much about and have so much more, you know, empathy for. And just just things that didn't even occur to me of what it's like, you know, just listening to their stories about transitioning from the military life to education and how the lack of structure, which some people would actually dispute, that we have in education <laughs> compared to the military, it's just all loosey goosey. <laughs> and there's too much. It's like they like they there's too much control in, 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 the, in the students hands and they're not used to that. They're used to having being told what to do and where and how and what. And then now it's like, whatever you want to do. And they're like, I don't know how to deal with that. I also heard, you know, um, stories from students about how they were treated by faculty, by other students. And I guess the way I, I understood it was, it, it was like people were confusing veterans 
with the military. And the veterans are the people who serve in the military, but they're people, they're individuals, they're humans. The military is, is you know, this entity. And so, but what, what, what they described to me is people who had issues with the military taking it out on the veterans and, and getting in their face and, and, and shouting at them and, and just, just really <sighs> broke my heart. You know, I mean, these people served and put their lives on the line. And a lot of the students I met, they, they literally served on the line, you know, the, the front line in, in Iraq or, or Afghanistan. And to come back and, and to be treated this way. And again, I don't think that they, it wasn't that they were expecting everyone to, you know, thank you for your service. Thank you for your service. It, it was just like, can I just be respected? And, and a lot of them, you're right, there, there's a big overlay with the, the differently able population. And the veteran population, and and there were students who would talk about, you know, because of my injuries, you know, sometimes I I just need to get up. I can't sit here. I can't sit for long periods of time. But but the teacher is telling me to sit down, sit down. And it's like I try to explain, you know, I've got a back problem. I cannot sit. I need I need to move around. Sometimes it's I'm not trying to be disrespectful. I, it, this is not it doesn't have anything to do with you. <laughs> this, you know, kind of thing. And so, again, it just opened my eyes. And more importantly, what I, that group and meeting with all these other groups did, it opened my heart. And I think that we I, if I can't you know, stress that enough about how we, we need to open again both our minds and our hearts to these students and li- listen to them, try understand them. And again, I'm, I'm never going to fully understand what it's like to be a doctor. But I feel like I, I have some understanding, enough to, to, to care about their experience and what they're going through. And, and if I can find a way to be helpful. Yes, thank you. That, that this, you said so much there. The, the distinction between military and veterans is so true. You know, veterans are not a monolithic group. But one, one of the things that I've seen time and time again is that they actually – they may have a veteran status, but they actually don't want to be treated special. They don't want, and many of them feel very uncomfortable when people say, well, thank you for your service. It, it, you know, so this group, what a lot of people know, don't know that go to a community college is that they were enlisted. There is a big difference, take it from me, from being enlisted and being an officer. Officers, their basic requirement to be an officer is a college degree. And then they can go to officer candidate school and all that. But if, if you don't have college and you go into the enlisted ranks, th- those are the, the working class, if you will, of, of the military. And so some of the poorest people in our communities join the military to serve. But there's also practical reasons. I want to learn a trade. I, I want to be able to help people. We kind of forget that that the veteran population is up within that there's already a, a large amount of disproportionately impacted students already people like there's so many veterans who are who are students of color for example and so they got that to deal with on top of you know being a veteran so so thank you for for mentioning that so as we wrap up i, I just wanted to summarize a little bit you know so we everybody knows your superpower so that's really important <laughs> We we talked about student success. I'm sorry, student support uh, redefining the six factors. You, you you touched on the through the gate research, the professional development. I'm really happy that we talked about a lot about the differently able students. So th- thank you so much for really unpacking that. And we also talked about assumptions that that educators make about students. As as we wrap up here, one of the things I'm really excited about, I, I saw your email about it, is that there's the RP group is going to do a study on African American students. Yes, it all started with a finding from the through the gate study, and so I mentioned that we disaggregated, you know, the, the that initial quantitative data set, and we looked at which students were more likely to either be what we called at the gate or near the gate. And again, that's to description of the students who had completed all or most of their transfer requirements, how many of those students transferred, right? So that, that's pretty much, you know, what we were looking at. And we disaggregated that. And what we found was that, again, when we looked at ethnicity in particular, we found that African-American students were the most, the most, likely to transfer among that group. 
But if you broaden the, you know, the typical, you know, measure of a transfer rate is you're looking at students from freshmen, right? You're looking at first time in college students, how many of them have transferred uh, four years, six years, whatever the time frame is, right? And in, in most cases, you find that African-American students are near the bottom of, of they have among the lowest transfer rates. So, you know, that, that makes you kind of go, wait a minute. So how, what, <laughs> like, how is that, you know, possible, right? That's kind of what it is, or it, not so much as not possible, but how does that happen? How do, how does a group of students who, when they start, probably have the lowest chance of transferring, right? Just looking at the, at the numbers to having the highest transfer rate. What something is happening <laughs> in that time period, right? We started to ask that question, and and I, you know, I said, there's got to be some kind of tipping point in here. There's there's at some point you go from being the least likely to the most likely. So what what is that? What what does that look like? Where, where is that happening? And how do we get more students to that tipping point? That's really where we're going with this. Is what let's figure out what it is, and then let's figure out how to get more students. Um, to that. So that's what this new study is looking at. We're, we're going to, again, follow a similar pattern that we did with Through the Gate, which is start with the quantitative data, learn as much as we can from that. And then we're going to go talk to these students. We're going to find African-American Black students at different points along the tipping point, right? The ones who you know, haven't made it there, the ones who have, the ones uh, who stopped out, the ones who transferred. We want to look at kind of that, that whole uh, continuum, and, and find out more from the students in terms of what is helping you. That's really what we want to focus on. But, but part of that is also going to naturally include what is stopping, right? What is it about what colleges are doing that's not working for your benefit? So what we want to do with this study is uh, identify what is this tipping point? What, what, what is happening? What, it, what is supporting students? you know, to get to that point and maybe what's standing in some students' ways, why they're not getting to that point. And again, the, the, what we want to do with that information is try to figure out how do we get more students to that point? <laughs> that, that seems like, you know, a pretty obvious thing is like, if we know they, if they get this far, their chances of success go up, you know, quite a bit. How do we get more students to that point? So, we're going to, um, we're just getting started with this study. We're going to follow a similar pattern that we did with Through the Gate, where we're going to look at the quantitative data and try to learn as much as we can from that. And then once we've kind of exhausted that, then we're going to go find these students. <laughs> and then we're going to talk to them. We're going to find students who are all along this continuum, right? Students who uh, haven't made it to the tipping point yet, students who have, students who have transferred, and those students who um, stopped out. Who, who didn't make it, you know, to or stopped out before they made it to the tipping point. To, to again, to learn as much as we can about how do we get more African American students uh, to transfer. Well, I can't, I can't wait for that study. One of the many things the RP group does that's so well is that when you do complete a study, it's not this very dense kind of research document. It it's easy to read. It has graphics. It has quotes. And then uh, you disseminate it everywhere. And on top of that, uh, provide webinars or PD to, to discuss it so that campuses can take action, be more informed, more data informed when um, you have these particular findings. So I, I can't wait for that one. We, it's funny, we tend to bump into each other at airports. That's like our, our meetings. <laughs> we both pre-COVID, we traveled so much and it just is so funny to see you at, I'm like, there's Darla. Uh, and then we would end up at the airport bar. So I, I can't tell you how much I'm looking forward to bumping into you again in the in the airport. And now that I know about your, your photography, next time I'm in the area, I'm going to contact you ahead of time and I, I want to visit and see all your your other way of, of telling the story, right? So I just, I want to thank you so much for participating in the Student Success Podcast. Thank you so much for your time. Is there anything you'd like to impart? Any last thing? Well, thank you. First of all, it's, it's always great to talk to you and I've missed you in the airports. So I'm glad that we had this opportunity. I, I appreciate everything that, that you're doing 
to to help help our students. So I, I want to again thank you thank you for this opportunity for me to speak, but also just everything that that you're doing. And if I could repeat one thing, emphasize one thing that I mentioned today is the stop with the assumptions. <laughs> you know, stop with the assumptions, especially if they're negative. You know, let's 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 assume the if you're going to assume anything, assume the best until otherwise proven, right? Let's let's assume that our students want to be here. And so many of them are trying so hard to be here, to be in school, to be present, to, 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 to succeed, to pass, to all of those things. And so let's, let's give them the benefit of the doubt uh, until they show us that, that they should, that we shouldn't, I guess. I mean, I hate to say not to give anyone the benefit of the doubt, but sometimes, you know, we, we, we are shown that, okay, maybe the student is not ready for the help that that is available for, for not ready to receive what I'm able to you know offer at this time, uh, but let's let's assume that our students have good intentions, you know, and that they they want to to be here, and they they want to succeed, and that we should be doing everything within our power to help them. Beautifully said, and and I, and I would say because as you know, colleges are going through tremendous change that we do that for for ourselves and, and as college educators to not make assumptions about one another because change is hard. Uh, changing a culture is very difficult. And, and if we treat each other where, with just more kindness, it, it'll make the work easier. Not easy. It's never easy, but a little easier. Well, if I could add one of the other things that really came out of Student Support Redefined, and and I will say I learned so much through that study just from going around and sharing it and having people react to it. And and one of the things I, I, I distinctly remember someone raising their hand during, you know, during the Q&A portion and said, you know, you've got me thinking about these factors, and I think they apply to me. <laughs> I need to be directed. I, I need to be focused. I, you know, I, I need to be nurtured. Of course, I need to be valued, but I also need to be engaged and connected. And, and I, I need to be looking at this. And that just sparked a whole thinking for, for us. And we've even gone out and talked about the factors from the perspective of employees and, and what, what would it look like? And so some of the exercise, right, is, is to figure out, okay, that we did this for students, but what would it mean if you were directed? What would it look like if you were nurtured, if you felt connected? So I, again, another parting <laughs> for us, thing for us to think about is the, uh, we call them six success factors. They're based on college students, but they apply to us as humans. I think, you know, um, I even did a presentation recently about how they apply to middle school students. <laughs> so it, it, it's ageless, you know, to some extent, and, and it's positionless. They, I, I think they they can be morphed um, into applying to our humanity and whatever we need, you know, both. And I would even argue in our personal and professional lives. So thank you for reminding me of that. I, I something I, I hope people will consider. Thank you for listening to the Student Success Podcast. Each episode has show notes, which include helpful links and necessary follow up information to help you get results. Please consider subscribing to the Continuous Learning Institute website. There are no advertisements. It simply updates about articles, tools, resources, podcasts, etc., all tailored for you, the practitioner. Thank you.